वेलकम टू योरेका आई एम गोहर रजा एंड यू आर वॉचिंग योरेका दिस स्मॉल टाइनी प्लेनेट विच इज कॉल्ड अर्थ इज ब्लू इफ यू लुक इट फ्रॉम अ वेरी लार्ज डिस्टेंस एंड इट्स रिवॉल्विंग अराउंड द सन एंड गोज ऑन एंड ऑन एंड ऑन इट्स द ओनली प्लेनेट विच इज ब्लू एंड इट्स द ओनली प्लेनेट विच सस्टेन्स लाइफ the blue color comes from ocean also scientists believe that life comes from ocean we are fortunate to have dr nakvi who is director of national institute of oceanography dr nakvi you come from a very small sleepy town far away from any water body of that magnitude which is called ocean or even sea how did this journey start how did you land up uh, being director of such an institute well this is a very interesting story um, i really didn't imagine that i would end up uh, leading an institute like the national institute of oceanography and in fact i thought i would join the industrial toxicology research center i did my msc in 1974 in physical chemistry and then i applied for a and physical chemistry has nothing to do apparently for a lay person like me with ocean well that's true but you know we can also look at the chemistry of sea water the marine chemistry is itself a, a separate discipline uh, and uh, that's true i mean i didn't want to i i i didn't imagine that i would join nio you have done very fascinating projects personally and also you have done a some sort of the kind that from a uh, chemical expert you became marine expert i think marine sciences are one of the best examples where all sciences submerge they confluence they come together physics zoology botany chemistry and today nanotechnology and almost every science because uh, that system itself is like a cosmos it has almost everything it's a treasure box for a scientist to open and unravel now what i would like to know is that during this period when things were moving on then did you envisage the kind of future that marine biology marine sciences have Well, at that time, 1974, I didn't. By the way, I mean, I'm a chemist, okay, and I look at chemical processes happening in the ocean. But you wouldn't find any chemical reaction in the ocean. Very seldom would you have. Would you characterize a process which is purely chemical, a reaction which is purely chemical? And as you rightly pointed out, it's the combination of different disciplines that. you know distinguishes oceanography from other uh, sciences because what happens in the ocean is that the chemistry is greatly influenced by the biology and vice versa uh, and they both are influenced by the physics so you need to have little knowledge of you know physical processes the circulation the water masses uh, the biology you know the composition of organism so uh, even if you are a chemist therefore we have a new area called biogeochemistry uh in which uh, you know you need to have uh, you know uh, a combination of all these sub disciplines uh, in uh, 1974 this area of, uh, of research was just emerging and we really didn't realize the kind of uh, advance advances that would uh, that were to happen later um you know in terms of molecular biology for example now we look at all these organisms the microbes uh, characterize them using the and, molecular and signatures there's so much of life and so much of life that you can look at and categorize it and then go back in time also to to find out what kind of evolution has taken place absolutely absolutely so again the oceans are the best suited to look at what happened in the past because you got the signatures you got the 
well preserved records of past changes in the marine sediments. So, in NIO for example, we have a large group of people who work on the paleo aspects, you know the paleo oceanography, uh, the paleo climate for example, they take long course uh, in the sediment. How deep uh, do we go into the ocean? Oh, the oceans are, you know the deepest part of the ocean is like 11 kilometers, that's the Mariana Trench. But uh, an average depth is just in excess of 4,000 meters. Correct. So the abyssal plains of the ocean are typically between 4 and 5 kilometers deep. Uh, what kind of uh, capability we have to explore? Oh, we can mm. go down to any depth, in fact. Uh, including uh, the, the lowest the, of the low? At least, uh, you know, the National Institute of Ocean Technology, for example, which is located in Chennai, is, has uh, built a, uh, an automated device uh, uh, that can go down to 6,000 meters water depth. So, we can explore. And how much uh, a human being can go? No, you as… Because the pressure keeps on increasing as you go down. Absolutely. For so every 10 meters, yeah. one atmospheric pressure increases. Yeah. So, if you are a scuba diver, it's not unsafe to go below 35 meters. But if you are within uh, a submersible, uh, you can go down to what your depth. Okay. So, people Then can you go maintain the pressure in… That. It's very hard life that anybody who is in ocean uh, spends, including scientists, they are no exception. You were telling uh, the story of going to Antarctica. How hard was it? Well, I was a part of the third expedition and uh, when we went out there, we didn't have a permanent base. So, our team, which was led by Dr. Hajj Gupta, one of the objectives was to build the main a objective. The main objective was to build this permanent uh, base, base there, and we did that uh, on the ice shelf, and that was called Dakshin Gangotri. We worked for two and a half months, so I mean those were really very very hard days because I remember times when I and you had to do everything with your own hands. Absolutely. So we were working like laborers, you know, and I had to sleep. There were times when I slept on wooden planks on ice shelf in a single man tent. So, those were, you know, really very, very but hard times. Do you think today when you look, look back that it was worth it? It was. Going there. Absolutely, absolutely. Was something very special. Unforgettable, unforgettable. Even experience. for a scientist? Absolutely, for anybody. For uh, anybody. Unforgettable experience, fantastic place, to, you know. And, and how, how important was that for science? I think we set up an infrastructure for science. We also did some science. In fact, we worked on uh, uh, lakes. Personally, I worked on, uh, you know, the waters around Antarctica. Uh, we published papers. So, I mean, we also got scientific output from that uh, expedition. Uh, but I think the, the highlight of the expedition was uh, the achievement. Technological main achievement and was, human. Was setting up was this model. permanent base, which allowed people to stay on for the entire year for longer period. India has a very long coast line and it's a very complex coastline because the temperatures vary great deal. Then we have energy problems, then we have offshore explorations, we have uh, uh, tidal energy and various forms of and then a lot of human population its life depends on uh, ocean. How many kinds of project uh, have you been involved in? Um, you know, there are people who are working on the energy resources, for example. In our institute, we have a major project on the gas hydrates, you know, the, the hydrated form of methane. And there are huge deposits of these gas, gas hydrates, uh, which are the most important, one of the most important uh, energy, potential energy resource. So, we have a major project working on them. Uh, on the gas hydrates. Then we have a major project on uh, on biodiversity and biology. Uh, then we are looking at the environment uh, because the coast, coastal environment is being disturbed by human activities. We have uh, a large group that works on geology and geophysics and also uh, the paleoceanography. Uh, and uh, I have a group which works on, uh, my own group works on biogeochemistry to look at, uh, you know, the carbon cycling, for example, nitrogen cycling. We specialize on low oxygen environments. 
the ecosystems associated with different kinds of uh, you know environments and how they are being impacted by human activities that's one major uh, area that we are focusing on right now uh, see the humanity started looking at the entire globe as one composite system where everything is interlinked to everything and then we realize that uh, anthropogenic uh, activities, human activities are maybe disturbing this entire system and this delicate spaceship is under threat. People called and still call a lot of environmentalists as uh, alarmists. But ocean has become arena of contestation for a large number of scientists. If environment is to be judged, it's the ocean where it needs to be judged because ocean controls the entire environment of the. Uh, how do you look at uh, at the whole problem of uh, this environment getting disturbed, and then we as a race uh, getting threatened? I think first of all, let me make it very clear: the people who think that you know these issues are you know imagination of uh, a few individuals. Absolutely wrong in my opinion. We are facing a major, major threat. The biggest threat this uh, planet Earth has faced in many, many uh, million years is the human induced changes that we are bringing to the various Earth science, uh, Earth systems. And the oceans are no exception. You know, the, we are releasing what about 10 billion tons of CO2 to the atmosphere every year. We know that the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere has just crossed 400 uh, ppm. Uh, by the way, in the last 1 million years for which we have... This is the average you are talking about. Uh, I'm talking about... CO, that's the average, average that's concentration. The, average. the concentration because there is some seasonal variability. Right. Uh, but then, you know, the, the highest concentration that has just been crossed is like 400 uh, ppm. Uh, and that's very unusual because in the last one million years we have we have records preserved in polar ice. Uh, the the concentration has always fluctuated between 180 to about 280 parts per million in the last one it's million. Almost years. two times. Uh, so the concentration has already increased from 180. It has gone up to I mean that was the lowest at the last glacial maximum. Now we have 400. Okay, and it would have been even higher had it not been for the ocean because the oceans have been absorbing about a quarter of what we are releasing to the atmosphere. Uh, okay, so the global temperatures are increasing, there is no doubt about it. The average temperature has increased by about 0.8 degrees Celsius, you know. We will come back to this, I have to take a break, do not go anywhere. The debate is getting more, more interesting, we will come back. Welcome back to Eureka. We are talking Dr. Nakhvi, who is director of National Institute of Oceanography. Uh, how alarming is the situation because of human intervention into this whole delicate system which has given birth to life? Now, life is under threat and maybe the entire globe is under threat. How alarming is the situation? 400 ppm CO2 level, does it mean that this system will not be able to take anything beyond that? No, it's going to rise further. And with business as usual scenario is going that to That is what your worry yeah, okay. is about. Uh, the problem is that even if we stop emitting the CO2 to the atmosphere right now, the concentrations will keep increasing for a while. Okay. Now, how, where do the oceans come into the picture? The oceans are absorbing about a quarter of what we are releasing to the atmosphere. But then the moment oceans in, uh, absorb this CO2, it becomes more and more acidic. Oceans become more and more acidic and some of the life forms cannot take this acidity, which means for a long time we will not see those life forms. Maybe never, in fact, if they get extinct, those species, never. So, for them it is alarming, but is it also alarming for the entire globe? You are talking about the 
you know, species like or the, the groups like the corals, for example, the ecosystems, the coral reef ecosystems are the most vulnerable to ocean acidification. By the way, the oceanic pH, surface oceanic pH has already fallen by about 0.1 pH unit and is likely to fall by, uh, by 0.3 pH units by the end of this uh, century. And that will, ha that will have catastrophic effect on marine life, not only the corals, which in most, in all likelihood, going to disappear because the, the water will become too acidic for them to right. to, to sustain. Uh, but uh, there would also be impact on smaller organisms called uh, plankton, uh, which make calcareous shells, uh, and they carry the all is uh, scallops. Uh, the scallops are, are uh, benthic the forms. I am talking yeah. about the no, microscopic, no, no, okay. the microscopic right. organism, both uh, which make shell, which make shells, and they are both plants and animals. Uh, and after they die, they carry the organic matter with them to the deep sea floor. So they are a part of what we call the uh, the oceanic uh, carbon um, pump. Okay, the biological pump. Uh, that uh, carries carbon from the surface layer of the ocean to the deep sea and right. that's one most single most important process that controls the atmospheric carbon dioxide content so if we are going to have changes in the ph regime if we want to if we make the oceans more acidic then the uh, these organisms are go not going to be there okay so this is going to have an impact on the uh, on the carbon pump, for example, and the food web structure is going to change. So it's not it's not just the corals, which, by the way, support about 20 percent or account for at least 20 percent of the biological diversity. So if these coral reefs are going to disappear, uh, along with them, uh, we are going to lose about 20 percent of the biological diversity. So this is going to have uh, a tremendous impact, tremendous impact on. Uh, not only ecology, but also the biogeochemistry, you know, elemental fluxes. Uh, uh, do, do these form part of uh, persistent pollutants or uh, it can be regenerated over a period of time? The system will regenerate itself, well, even if there is some damage. You know, the thing is that the system is not going to get back to its uh, pre-perturbation state for thousands of years. So you're going to talk about uh, disappearance of life uh, on that time scales, uh, those kind of life forms which are susceptible to, very susceptible to those environmental changes. You were the first scientist who reported that denitrogenification uh, is going to happen at a very fast rate in uh, Arabian Sea. Now, how important was that for, for studies in oceanography? Okay, you know, in the oceans, generally the, the deep water is uh, oxygenated because of the circulation, you know, there are currents which originate at high latitudes, which supply oxygen to the subsurface waters. And very often, uh, you find that there is enough oxygen at all depths of the ocean. But there are certain areas where a combination of biology and physics ensures that the oxygen concentrations are maintained at very low levels and there are three major sites in the ocean where it happens. These are called the oxygen minimal zones. Uh, one is located, the first one is located in northern Indian Ocean in the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal and we have two others in the eastern Pacific Ocean. Uh, now the northern Indian Ocean contains one of the most intense oxygen minimum zones in the world. Uh, and what happens in these zones is that uh, because there is no oxygen, there is continuous supply of uh, organic matter from the surface, there are certain bacteria which uh, begin to use nitrate, which is a very important nutrient. You know, it, they oxidize organic matter using nitrate. So right. they reduce nitrate in that process to molecular nitrate. This is oceanic nitrogen cycle. It's a part of the we ocean are nitrogen about cycle. So on, on soil, we have very important nitrogen cycle where fixation takes place. Well, the same thing happens in the ocean almost also. Same nitrification, thing denitrification. What I just talked about is denitrification. Right. And uh, what we showed is that whatever was demonstrated was that the Arabian Sea was the largest oceanic denitrification, is the largest oceanic denitrification site. 
uh, and one which is again very susce very susceptible, very vulnerable to human induced changes because it's a delicate system. Absolutely, because what's happening is that with the changes in in uh, circulation, which again are uh, is caused by uh, which are caused by changes in uh, the you know the atmospheric circulation, the uh, you know global warming effect is going to have uh, a major major. Uh, modification of uh, the oceanic uh, circulation and that is going to cause an intensification of the oxygen minimum zone and uh, there is some evidence that is actually already happening uh, that the oceanic oxygen minimum zones are uh, going to expand uh, and that is going to lead to changes in denitrification rates and it will have a major impact on the nitrogen cycle which is a major, major biogeochemical cycle uh, in, on our planet. You received many awards and laurels. Uh, the first one, probably the biggest first one in your life was Young Scientist Award and then Indian equivalent of Nobel Prize which is called Bhatnagar Award. Um, how excited were you when you received these awards? Well, to be honest with you, I was very excited. But uh, then you do not only work for uh, awards. You Basically, is the I mean no scientist worth his salt has ever worked for money or awards. Awards come their way, but they do excite. They do. They do excite. Yeah. They also help because you know that somebody is noticing your uh, your research, and then it's definitely um, you know um, it helps really. Okay, uh, a very difficult question to answer. That which thing helped you? in achieving these heights. It was your teachers, it was your hard work, dedication or you are an example of a fit mind survives in a fit body. I think I was uh, at the right place at the right time. Um, <laughs> but then you know I must give credit to <laughs> Is it a diplomatic my, answer? <laughs> I must it give and that includes people who I work with, uh, people like Rabin Sen Gupta, my teacher, my PhD advisor. Uh, it helped, but then you know people have to work hard to achieve anything. Uh, so I tried to do my best, but uh, you know, as I said, I was at the right place at the right time. Would you like to give a message to the younger generation who is getting away from science? A lot of people are scared. Um, I think things are changing. We have in place a program called Inspire. Uh, an initiative taken by the Department of Science and Technology. They are awarding every year about 10,000 fellowships. Um, and they are, the idea is basically to attract young minds to science, which is not happening right now. I think it's going to bear fruits in the years to come. Um, but for all those budding young scientists, I have only one thing to, to tell. Uh, you know, there is no substitute for hard work, you know, one could be really smart, but uh, to survive in science. So, science is not difficult, but… You, you have, have to, to be persistent, uh, okay, you have to be tenacious, you have to be tenacious. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have to work really hard and, and read, and read, that is most important, because you have to be up to date with the literature. So. Uh, simply being, I mean, I have seen many young people who were very smart, but they did not succeed just because they did not have the other qualities. And if you have to go to Antarctica, go to Antarctica, get the data, come back. Absolutely. <laughs> it was nice having you on the show. Thank you very much. We will come back next week with another fascinating personality who has excelled in science. Keep watching Eureka every week.